Okay, so um, there was a cartoon that came out a couple days before the present White House incumbent uh, had his inauguration. Believe it or not, this was just uh, this was just last year, January. Um, I mean, hard to. Like, seems like a, a lot longer time. Uh, and um, in this cartoon, there was a, uh, it, came in, it came in three images, you know, three windows. And, and the first one was um, Martin Luther King saying, uh, uh, the arc of the moral universe is long. And then in the second window, Barack Obama says, but it bends towards. And then in the third window, there's a picture of uh, Trump and his Republican colleagues sitting down, getting ready to sign bills. And, uh, and above that, they're saying, just us. <laughs> And uh, this kind of sums up the crisis of, of moral responsibility, uh, uh, moral vision, historical responsibility uh, in our, that I think many of us in, in this room really feel uh, surging through ourselves uh, and through the world today. You know, I think of, of this week's themes that, what a rich, I mean, we, I say this week, I mean, it was just like 48 hours ago, less than that. Uh, and um, yeah, like 40 hours ago, how packed it's been, rich with and dense with um, I, thoughts and feelings and, and uh, um, imaginative uh, uh, insights. And let me just mention three of them by way of kind of pulling back the, the, the powerful um, you know, themes that we've been that we've been exploring. One, uh, the cosmological imagination. Um, I just gave uh, Brian and, uh, yeah, see, see that little booklet there? It's called, that was the Cosmological Imagination Conference that we put on, uh, PCC put on, what, it must have been 15 years ago, 16 years ago, early 2000s, um, 2002. Very rich conference, cosmological imagination, and we just addressed that from all these different things. And, and, and Brian uh, kind of channeled this coming in here t uh, two nights ago uh, and, and speaking about that issue of how can we best participate uh, in um, it through the cosmo via the cosmological imagination uh, uh, so that we can inhabit the evolutionary universe. And then uh, thinking of a second theme that has been very uh, present from that first night on, um, very strongly present yesterday as well, and, and it's that commitment that I think we all feel here uh, that is um, like the, the cosmological imaginative participatory commitment is very intertwined with in a, in a, a complex way with a sense of the importance of the evolution of our, of, of our moral imagination, of our, um, our passion, our desire, our, 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 uh, our capacity for, for reflexivity um, in, re uh, in relationships, uh, in reflex like a kind of relational reflexivity, kind of um, um, psychological reflexivity, a philosophical reflexivity, questioning, bringing to light the, the assumptions uh, through which we uh, are const constellating our reality, um, and our, our capacity for, uh, linked to all this, our capacity for compassion and, um, and for our sense of beauty and, uh, and of a higher good. Now, Iris Murdoch 
uh, the great British philosopher calls uh, the good. Um, it's, it's the privileged focus of our will and attention. Uh, and Charles Taylor, who builds on this, uh, talks about it as the, um, as the object of our love and allegiance. And um, these, these are, these are um, the good and everything that I just described in relationship to uh, the, the good, the privileged focus of our, of our uh, will and attention and the object of our love and allegiance. Uh, it, if we, th that defines us, that constitutes us. Without that, we fall apart. We, we have no identity. We, we, we're, we're inoperable. We're, uh, these are what, um, these are essentially what Jake was talking about as the, they're transcendental conditions for being a human being. You don't have, a person that doesn't have uh, uh, the, that narrative uh, 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 and moral frame of reference, it's a moral spiritual frame of reference that we inhabit. Uh, and if we don't, um, a, a person who doesn't have that, and, and, and there's a narrative that goes with it because we're, we're always in a movement f uh, towards or away from. Uh, and without that, we, we, we lose our very identity. So uh, from the very first night with the cosmological imagination and the, uh, being brought up, and then even then we are already talking about the need for, uh, with, with that, the cosmos is also evolving uh, our desire, our passions, our, our, uh, our I think even the very uh, character of our symbolic discernment in, is, is, is evolving. And uh, that's key to what we are doing in PCC. And the third theme that I think has, uh, or a third theme that's run through our, our our week is um, our, our experience of, our vision of, um, uh, an evolving uh, PCC community, that, that uh, our participation in it, our inhabiting uh, it, and, in, and participating in its evolution, how uh, that in some sense has become part of our identity as well, part of that constituting um, uh, spiritual horizon within which many of us live. So, this kind of vast cosmic level and the uh, within it, embedded in it, uh, the, the deep, um, the deep uh, moral uh, dimension of our of our evolution, and then here in our very local, humble, um, but precious way, our PCC community. Now, um, the, that statement, by the way, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but uh, it, it bends towards justice. That was, of course, used by, um, used by um, Martin Luther King at a number of key points in the 60s, Selma, uh, uh, his great Selma speech in 1965, but also his very last speech just before he died in 68. It came up a number of times. It was very important to him. And of course, Obama picked it up uh, uh, in, in our own last decade, and it was part of his self-definition in many ways and what he, how he saw America. What's interesting uh, is that, of course, um, as some of you know, that statement did not originate with King. That was, uh, uh, in the beginning, he, he would quote uh, its, its originator, and then as is the not uncharacteristic thing with, with, uh, with a preacher or whatever. There's a, there's a few references, uh, then as has been said, and then pretty much it's just, it's just said, and one has, in some sense, become identified with the origin, and uh, uh, so, um, but its origin was Theodore Parker, who um, in many ways is uh, one, one of the most uh, extraordinary people of the, 
of the 19th century. He was a transcendentalist. He was a uh, major uh, women's suffrage supporter, very close to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, for example. He was uh, at the forefront of the abolitionist movement, um, penal reform, uh, he anti-war um, uh, activist, social justice activist on behalf of the poor against the very rich, uh, um, or tr trying to wake them up uh, ethically to, uh, to that injustice. Um, he was even, when he gave, and just, this is just a quick moment by way of honoring our ancestors, because uh, um, a lot of times we don't talk about someone like Theodore Parker, but here, here was this guy, and he would, get, he would give sermons in Boston. Um, he was part of that transcendentalist group where Emerson, Thoreau, and the, the Alcotts uh, uh, were all part of, and um, so many people came to his sermons, like 2,000 every Sunday. Boston only had 60,000 people. Um, that's a lot of action there. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who went to his sermons each week, he, 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 she said it was he was the one who uh, um, awakened her to the idea of the uh, Divine Mother as part of the, uh, Trini uh, part of the Christian Trinity. Um, and uh, when, when, when Betty Friedan, um, Uh, as she sparked the, the women's movement in, in 63 with the, with the uh, feminine mystique, she, um, she started the book with an epigraph from uh, Parker, uh, and it said this, the domestic, uh, he said this, the domestic function of the woman does not exhaust her powers to make one half of the human race consume its energies in the functions of housekeeper, wife, and mother is a monstrous waste of the most precious material God ever made. 1853. <laughs> um, so, I mean, he was basically on all the right sides of the right issues, very uh, and passionately and eloquently. Um, and his actual quote, if I can um, give that to you, uh, is um, slight. It's, a, it's got a little bit more uh, richness to it, and it also has that human touch of, uh, that human sense of we, we are always seeing through a glass darkly. Um, and so how he, here's how he put it. He was talking about the abolitionist cause. This is, this is um, 1853, he, you know, we're years before the Civil War. You have no idea what's to come. <laughs> Uh, whether there will be success. Slaves have been um, part of the American fabric uh, for a structure of society for years. And he's, but he had faith in the, uh, the eventual success of this cause, and he put it this way. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, and from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Wow. Uh, it's a, it, it really uh, captures the, um, I think, so much of what we're doing here, because even his phrase, uh, that term, moral universe, wow. Okay, so he's, you know, so he's a transcendentalist too. So he's, he's, he's right on the, um, you know, there was the universe, there was the cosmos that let's say God created for, you know, um, conventional biblical religion. And then there was God. Uh, and uh, the, the moral dimension existed in God and then the universe was, you know, like prima materia uh, in, 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 in a, uh, more uh, conventional religious distinction. And by his using that uh, wonderfully delicious, um, ambivalent term, um, moral universe, he gives us a kind of bridge because he could be talking about the evo evolution of the, of the human conscience. 
And that, that's the moral universe he's talking about. In the same way we'd say, like, mm, she's, a, she's a star in the, in, in the musical universe. We're talking about the universe of music, in a sense, not, not that the universe is musical, the way Kepler heard it, for example, or uh, we, we, we uh, astro archetypal astrologers and so forth. Um, he could be meaning that, but uh, by using that term, I think he is um, implicitly and certainly giving us the uh, potential to unpack uh, a, a closer reading of and, and joining of moral and universe, and that, the, that there is something within the evolution of the cosmos which is itself um, following an, an arc, uh, a, an arc that is bending towards the good. Um, of course, going back to that, that cartoon, um, this is, uh, this is just the question, is there an arc of moral history, uh, uh, is there an arc of the moral universe happening in history that is um, looking like it's going in the right direction? Um, is there a, uh, an underlying telos to our history? Is there, a, can, can we trust it, uh, that we are living out uh, something like a morally significant destiny or is it, um, you know, a, a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing, sound and fury, Shakespeare and Faulkner. Uh, um, that question really presses on us. Uh, when, when, when King was saying it, see, King also had very deep cosmological um, intimations, and he was embedding his, uh, this is something that our, our uh, own Drew Dellinger has explored so well in his dissertation, and it's been a, really a passion of his life, is just the connection between um, King's social justice uh, commitments and, and vision and his sense of the cosmological interrelatedness of all things. So when he was using that term, moral universe, um, he, I, I have a feeling he really did want that deeper cosmological dimension to be uh, implied. Um, but, and, and certainly it is, it is at the heart of what I think many of us here in PCC, I mean, all of us are committed to some vision of, of a higher good. And for most of us, that sense of the good includes social and ecological justice and um, clean water for children and for fish. Uh, and the importance of a, of a life-enhancing civilization um, and the opportunity for uh, creative individuation on uh, uh, all parts, uh, it, the, uh, the growth of, of freedom and, and love. It includes uh, our allegiance to the, to the Earth community. Um, and here in PCC, it often, it includes an allegiance to an ensouled cosmos. And, um, and it's not only an ensouled cosmos, because deeply connected to this is a sense that uh, we are compelled by, engaged by, a vision of some kind of evolution of consciousness. Uh, and in this way, Parker's statement fits just perfectly, about, and when we combine that with a sense of an ensouled cosmos, it suggests a kind of panpsychic, uh, teleological vision of a moral universe. And, uh, and yet now, at this crucial moment uh, in our history, when um, that we, we, in some sense, are forced to question the existence of that telos with more urgency than we have perhaps had to in uh, so acutely in decades. 
we all know we're skating on thin ice these days. I mean, in just about every sense. I mean, there's just each day we go through our day. I mean, we are generally, I say we in this room are generally so um, buffered and protected in, in our, 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 our communities where we live, uh, whether it's California or, or some of the other places that each of you have gone from, come from. In general, uh, we, are, uh, we are so safe in a certain way, and yet at the same time, of course, fires can come right through our, uh, you know, last thing I said to Yvonne before I left is I said, if a fire comes, which can come like that, we're right up against, you know, the China Camp State Park, and uh, um, I, I said, you know, call me right away. I could drive there, there in an hour to try to start evacuating things. I've had to evacuate twice from Big Sur um, from fires. All my life work, you know, trying to get it out of there before, um, way before Passion of the Western Mind was published. And uh, so I just told her, which said, if, I, if, if you need to, here are the boxes that if they, we don't get them out of there, I, I, I'm not going to recover <laughs> um, um, this, this, this lifetime. So we, we have that, and that's just a small um, uh, peril that the whole world, of course, is going through. So when we look at this larger global situation and we, we, we approach it from all the different dimensions that you know, we, we explore in our courses here and that each of us is carrying different facets of with, with uh, lesser or greater insight. And that's why we are all in a community in which we keep um, learning from each other. I've learned so much this, these last three days uh, being here and uh, being in, um, each person is just bringing things like, oh, that's right, that's how, you know, it's just so important what we're taking in from each other. And part of that uh, multi-perspectival uh, attention, attentiveness that we're bringing to our contemporary moment helps us see just how multifaceted, multidimensional our uh, our crisis is, our global crisis is. It's ecological, it's spiritual, it's social, it's economic, uh, it's moral, it's political, um, gender relations, race relations, species relations. Uh, we, uh, the, if we look at the uh, quality of the crisis, and we see certain fundamental facets of it, like the fact that there is a kind of crisis of identity that humanity, and certainly modern civilization, is having to go through. Most human beings for the last, you know, 100,000 years have lived within mythic um, uh, vessels within which uh, their ident identity was pretty stable, and it was pretty stable generation after generation with the, with the traditions of, of uh, the ancestral uh, passing of the, of the baton, of the myths, of the rituals. And um, I mean, even for many of us into our, in, into our childhood, we got a pretty solid sense of what's, if it was, you know, America, or um, the, a, a, a being uh, Jewish, or, or Christian, or, or uh, uh, Hindu, whatever, whatever it might happen to be. All that is so uh, up in the air now for so many people. Um, the very, and not just the, the religious frames of reference, um, but the very sense of is the human project is the, is, is the human being a cancer on this earth or something that was like the, the noble crown of creation. I mean, that's, it's like suddenly the, the opposite shadow uh, of the, um, that l luminous vision of what humanity was about has just completely made itself viscerally 
apparent in, 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 in our lives to the observant um, among us. And, the, and if we look at that quality of having to face the shadow just on an unprecedented scale, m what men are needing to do, many are doing, so much more has to be done the, of, of, of facing the shadow of, of the male, of patriarchy, uh, the shadow of, of the churches, of, of, virtu of, of religion itself, of virtually every religion um, has, it, its, its shadow has, has uh, erupted into uh, our consciousness as in ways that are just unprecedented. Just take the Pennsylvania uh, report of the, the Catholic Church where, where, you know, basically, as I was saying to Jake the other day, I mean, the, the Pope and the, and, and, and the Vatican, the bishops, I mean, really just need to cover themselves with, and I'm, I think very highly of so much of Pope Francis, obviously, uh, uh, but in terms of the state of the Catholic Church, it really, it just, it, it needs to cover itself in ashes and get on its knees and, um, and, in, and in some sense uh, uh, die like its founder um, in order to, you know, seed the, uh, its gift, of which, which it has been carrying uh, at, at another level. But the shadow of humankind itself, all these different qualities of our, uh, uh, of our industrial civilization, of our mode of consciousness, of the way our technology, uh, which seemed to be, I mean, some of you are old enough to remember, but in the 1990s, when the internet was spreading, um, it was filled with utopian uh, idealism. I mean, Indra's net and uh, the, the radical dem democratizing and pluralization of, of uh, information and, and power and participation and. Um, and so, in all these ways, including the sense of uh, existential um, uncertainty of a very fundamental, like, uh, survival, uh, a, an encounter with mortality, not just individual mortality, but somehow the encounter with, with the mortality of, of, of our Earth community in anything, any form such as it is uh, we, we grew up with. All these things point to um, a, a, a certain form of experience that tribal rituals and myths have for millennia um, constellated around and deliberately induced for the members of uh, the tribe in order to go through an initiation, that there would be um, a separation from, uh, you know, an, a sense of isolation, of alienation from, from the mothers, from the tribal community, and then put through this ordeal, this pressure cooker of utter isolation, a, uh, a, a suffering, the, the encounter with, with death, the sense that one actually was dying. Uh, a total identity crisis, um, a crisis of meaning itself. And it would be through this uh, uh, profound ordeal that we would awaken, that, that the people who participated in that were able to um, experience in that the mystery of death and rebirth they would come into contact with the great archetypal meanings and forces deep within that can only be contacted in, in, in such a uh, uh, special and challengingly difficult way uh, in order to come back into uh, the, tr the tribal life with a new wisdom and a new self-possession and a sense of the orienting the life of the tribe physical and spiritual uh, for seven generations hence, and that's how the decisions are made. And we don't have those rituals. Uh, sacred rituals are, are um, I mean, there's attempts, of course, in the counterculture and so forth to recreate, uh, and, and very important ones, but as a whole, our society knocked out 
uh, sacred rituals and with it the sacred cosmology that both contained the ritual, gave it its raison d'etre, but the nature of the ritual was what got us in contact with the sacred cosmos. So the whole feedback loop has uh, gotten uh, broken. But as a result, it's that created a kind of pressure cooker in modern civilization to essentially create on, in a literal, global way, exactly the experience that uh, the individuals would go through in the, in the uh, rite of passage. And so instead of us being separated from the, from the mothers or the rest of the uh, tribal community, we are separated from the entire community of life. The Homo sapiens has just made itself into the only uh, conscious intelligence, purposeful, uh, <laughs> capable of spiritual aspiration and so forth in the whole cosmos, which it is disenchanted and voided of all meaning and purpose. And so, of course, we're alienated and disoriented and we've lost our spiritual horizon. Uh, and so instead of it being the tribe, it's the whole earth community, it's the whole cosmic um, uh, communion of subjects that we have alienated our, ourselves from and blinded our vision to, and, uh, and now we're having to go through this um, planetary level of, of a death rebirth rite of passage. Um, and the uncertainty that we all feel about what the next year is going to look like or 10 years from now or what our children are going to, our grandchildren are going to be facing. Um, that uncertainty is also a, a crucial part of such a, um, a transformational process. Every shaman knows it, every tribal uh, ritual of, of uh, initiation, uh, rite of passage has built into it that you cannot be absolutely confident that it's going to all come out just handy dandy or else there's no moral transformation that's going to happen. You've got to really feel everything's at stake. Uh, and, um, you know, as some of you have heard me say, you can't have a pretend near-death experience. Uh, people who have near-death experiences really have uh, a reconfiguration of their moral uh, structure of life in a way that is just more fundamental than virtually any other possible experience. And that's what initiation's about. So, uh, this brings me to the last... Um, part of our, uh, what, what we're um, I mean, trying, seeking to do here in the, this week, this, uh, this, this brave um, experiment and education and living that PCC represents. And that is uh, the idea that um, in this postmodern era uh, of, of, of such volatility, complexity, ambiguity, uncertainty, multiplicity, um, uh, return of the repressed, uh, and nobility. Um, individuals cannot do it on their own. We need, uh, we need communities, and if we take the word hero and think of it as like, uh, defi define it as the heroic is uh, that the hero, the heroine, is the person who has a vision of the good that in some sense, uh, like of a higher good that in some sense stands apart from and uh, <coughs> beyond the, con the, 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 the conventional tradition um, and helps to uh, bring back to that community uh, the treasure from their, uh, their ordeal. But we need heroic communities. We don't, we, we, we don't just, we can't do it with just heroic uh, individuals. And my sense is that uh, PCC is such, uh, is such a community. There are many of them out there. Um, I think of, uh, you know, Waldorf schools and, and uh, Jungian societies and um, Findhorn and um, Damenhur and uh, 
Omega and Schumacher and Ions and Esalen and so forth, Pacifica, uh, they, they take many different uh, forms. And the astrological communities, the, the um, eco-feminist uh, organizations and so forth. And uh, yet there is a, a, a challenge to being a heroic community. And here I want to bring in the symbolism that uh, Matt, uh, Matt brought up about how going right back to the origins of our, of our species, over and over again, the cosmos gave us these such powerful um, symbolic presences uh, of, of the sun and the moon uh, that defined the seasons and uh, defined the day and the night. And if we think of the sun, that, that singular, brilliant, powerful light that, that rises uh, uh, at dawn as the earth spins and turns and uh, conquers the darkness, uh, and it goes on its journey, it goes on its arc. Uh, and that's the hero's journey, the solar, the solar arc through the sky. And then, and then it, it uh, descends. Our, our civilization, uh, and particularly modern civilizations, all been about the ascent, higher and higher, the, 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 the heroic achievement. But they leave out the fact that the solar trajectory goes down, the sun has to go down. This is Nietzsche's great uh, insight. I call on all those who are courageous enough to go down. Uh, he recognized that we had, and where are we going down? We're going down into the night, into the, um, into the lunar ground. Uh, the sun is the ruler of the day. The moon is the ruler of the night. And, the, and they're two very different lights because when the moon shines, you get to see many other lights at the same time. There's like m many truths, many, many, many lights are present. Not just that one brilliant light where you see everything very, very, very clearly and um, uh, with, with such uh, yeah, you know, vi vividness and distinction, uh, the, the, that luminosity of very focused consciousness. The moon is a more diffuse guy. It's not unconscious uh, as it's, it's more what a certain type of solar consciousness tends to be unconscious of. And the lunar, con the lunar is the ruler of uh, the night sky, where you, when you look up at the night sky, which we've, we've been able to do these, these nights here with the, the full moon, and you, you get to see deep space. You get to see, in some sense, into the whole of the cosmos. You don't do that in the sun. In the sun, you're, not, you're, you're, very, you're, you, you're very focused, you're seeing a lot, but you're not getting the whole. The moon is the symbol of the whole. It's the matrix of the, of, of all of the universe. It's the, that's part of its relationship to the great, great mother goddess, um, uh, the matrix of, of, of all being. And then the night is pregnant with each day, and it gives birth to each day, and the sun uh, rises, is born, goes on its journey, it dies, and as it dies into the night, it goes into the underworld journey, and it goes into the crucible of the transformation of consciousness where the solar and the lunar come together. Um, and w that's another thing about that, that the the night sky has a different relationship between light and shadow, light and darkness, way different uh, than the sun. And um, the sun creates a huge shadow. The moon's in a much different relationship between uh, light and darkness, much more mysterious. It's, and it's closer to our imaginations, our dreams when we sleep at night. It's closer, it's, it's where the romance is, it's where the, the magic is. Um, uh, new possibilities, the imagination. And it is in that, um, in that act of dying and sort of self-submitting into surrendering into the whole 
on behalf of the whole, but carrying everything that one has individuated through uh, your life uh, and, and kind of seeding that into the whole and then dying and then the, the solar lunar conjunctio uh, happens, the, the sacred marriage, the heroes gamos, and it's out of that the conception for a new birth, a new life, a new day, and, and a, a, a new sun comes, is born into, into a, a new heaven and a new earth. And that's the, that's the great um, solar lunar you know, mythic cycle. And we're in the, uh, we're in the postmodern underworld right now. We're in that great crucible of, of, of facing that shadow and going through this profound kind of deconstruction of our identity and, and uh, being on the, the Garden of Gethsemane and taking in the shadow of what human, our, ourselves uh, and our humanness uh, ha has inside, it, inside us. Uh, and... Um, what communities can do is hold space for each other to go through this transformation because it's so, um, I, Ari kind of uh, alluded to this last night with his great presentation of his paintings. How, how, how important it is for us as a community to serve itself as, see, heroic community. Heroic is the solar, the community is the lunar. And um, to serve as a as a nourishing matrix of, of individuation, of flowering. That's, that's, by the way, what Jung meant by individuation, was flowering. But there's a big difference between flowering in a potted plant and flowering out of the soil of the earth. And that's what our, um, I believe, PCC's community uh, ideally has been doing and can continue to do, which is to um, serve as a, uh, as a matrix of, of, uh, of care for the initiatory transformation of each of us as we go through our, our, our journeys that are often painful um, and deeply transformative and paradigm shifting in ways that uh, can be uncomfortable at times. And, but, and, but holding each other, holding space for that. At the same time, the heroic community also has to have a, a, a solar function in the sense that we need to be, we're carrying some, a kind of vision. When I say heroic vision or heroic community, put quotes on it so we're, we're not thinking of John Wayne necessarily, um, but we know what a true hero is. Um, they jump down into the subway to save the person that just fell down there who they don't know. Um, uh, uh, and um, the, so we, while nurturing the pluralism of our individual geniuses and visions, we, we also are holding a kind of family of uh, interrelated uh, uh, visions that have a kind of underlying luminosity and coherence that we are bringing into the world, kind of like the light of the sun, uh, into the greater uh, society uh, to, to help seed it with that. But at the same time, we have to be porous to that society. We can't be all buffered. We have to be, we, otherwise you've become a cult. You've, you, 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 you've got your own uh, vocabulary that nobody else can uh, understand. You've got your own you know, private rituals and, uh, and, and it's a kind of um, introverted psychosis on a collective level. We have to be in constant dialogue with the bigger world, with the larger society, being able to speak uh, in, in many different contexts, conferences, families, uh, city, town halls, and so forth. And uh, also porous to the great cosmos. And here's the, f the final point I would make, is that um, it's, uh, ultimately it's the community of the cosmos that we need to turn to and uh, that we um, must open up to. And I think it's this, f this recognition that so many comes from so many different um, teachers, uh, and by teachers I mean 
students and faculty uh, and alums that have been part of our community now, what there must be four or five hundred of us all together now, uh, that we learn from each other. And there's a, um, the, the cosmos that together we are unfolding that is realizing itself through our us and our, our struggles and our, our epiphanies, um, this, va this vast cosmos of, of meaning and, and purpose, uh, it reveals a certain care for the earth and for each individual uh, and, and every moment on it this kind of synchronistically orchestrated movements of the planets, the sun and the moon and the earth and all of this on it. And um, in a way we can help, as Chad uh, said once, you know, just as the community is holding space for each of us in PCC, the cosmos can hold space for us. Why? Because the cosmos of space is not empty. It's not a voided, it's not a meaningful, meaningless void. It's, uh, it is saturated with, with soul, with psyche, with meaning. It's only in the, the, the kind of temporary Cartesian uh, imagination that helped differentiate us and you know, played some positive roles, uh, but also has just worked uh, to uh, uh, help constellate a very um, critical situation today. It's, but it's basically helped constellate um, a, uh, a death rebirth initiatory crisis. And so I guess I want to end with this idea that through our own, not just our studies, but our care for each other and our continual work uh, and play in our inner journeys, like um, the working on ourselves, the, the, the transformational practices that each of us have, that we can um, discover that ground of trust in the universe that can uh, help us, this, this trust in the ensouled cosmos, that can help us be uh, a, a centering presence for the larger human community as we all undergo the, the profound initiatory transformation of our age. So that's all I had to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of my old friends here know many of these things I've said in similar ways at different times, but I don't know, it just seemed like pulling, in my attempt to kind of pull together what was meaningful to me from this weekend, and also just the, this uh, crucial moment we're in. I mean, this crucial week we're in. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, it felt like the right thing to talk about. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Um, Jake, where, where where are we? Should we do? Should we just go to the uh, to the to the the ritual, or should, do you want to have discussion? It's totally up to you. Probably had, they're they're going to ring the bell for lunch. Very okay, sure. let's do that. But we can go late. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> that is also true. Uh, but just really. Sure. We'll take a, we'll take a couple questions. Okay. Let's take yeah. If, uh, uh, or questions or, or, or contributions. Brian, you got something. No. He just wanted to put it off there. I, 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 just reflected, I, I, I was really struck. I, thank you. That was beautiful. And really needed and really important. And I'm so glad, especially that our distance students got to come and be part of the in person community here and, and, and hear that embodied in, in person. But I kept. While, while I was listening, it, it was just so beautiful and hitting all the news we needed to hear. I just kept flashing on this irony of um, the administration speaking to the UN this morning and being like the laughed off the podium. And I was like, Rick could be there. You know, any of you in this room could be there saying sensible, compassionate, wise, inclusive 
thing. And I'm like, just the, the irony and the distance just struck me. So just thank you for bringing these words into this space so that we can carry them out and, and, and share them with people who need them. And they're really needed. And hasn't it always been that thus? I mean, yeah. the, 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 new, um, the new vision and the seed for the next uh, age uh, always comes far from the centers of power in a very humbled, uh, um, you know, kind of location and so forth. Um, not, not in front of the big UN. Uh, even though we've had, I guess, Vassal Favel and, 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 and a few other greats there, but it's a, it's a rare, rare thing and they get them out as fast as they can. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. That meant a lot. Rick, you came oh. off just to vote for the, the importance of what we're doing here in this time and space and community. And I'm just thinking ahead to what we're hoping to be doing in the spring. And it just seemed to me that what your talk is could not have been a better uh, commercial message, if you will, uh, for the need and the importance of these gatherings, and I think we all should be ambassadors to the four or five hundred people that are comprising a, a larger community of alums and current students. The, the importance of being here together in the work we're doing. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Jane and Laura, shall we, we, we yes. um, embark? I guess I would say one thing. Um, uh, thank you so much, Rick, again. Uh, I think the one thing that struck me about the talk um, was you know, the, the dire situation that we're in and all the ways that you described. They seem to all boil back to relationship. Mm -hmm. It's the relational mm -hmm. dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't know exactly what to say other than that. Yeah, that's, I thought it was so great that uh, Matt yesterday brought up loving us and the key uh, of relationship is, 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 is the key. These people who are like really great, uh, or you know, great in quotes, um, teachers, prophets or whatever, but have lousy relationships with their spouses or children and um, you know, I mean it just, it's, it it's so starts there uh, and ends there um, in many ways. And yeah, just the moral imagination um, has so much to do with our, uh, the evolution of the relationship, uh, the capacity for relationship, which, which, which Brian alluded to on the very first night. I mean, just the, there's the stickleback fish, there's the, uh, there, uh, there's, 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 there's humans, there's, and then there's different ways of being human, et cetera. And um, we do seem to be coming into more and more uh, profound ways of entering into I thou relationship. Uh, yeah, it's so key, and including with the earth community itself and, and our, our fellow animals and plants and water and air. Okay. <laughs>